this week on the Back Table Podcast. I honestly have not found like a person who said, I'm doing simulation and everything's perfect, right? So you either have admin time that somebody will support you and be in protecting you from clinical work in some shape or form, or it comes from above, or, you know, honestly, I think more effective interventions at this point are like short intervals of like short repetitive sessions. Like for example, this morning, you're going to say like, this is crazy, but I did a robot sim this morning from six until seven before the OR started because there is no other way to do it, right? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable OBGYN podcast, your source for all things obstetrics and gynecology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on backtable.com. All right, and welcome to the Backtable OBGYN podcast. This is Mark Hoffman, and I've got with me our co-host, Dr. Amy Park. Amy, how are you? Great, great. I'm so happy to be here today. Did you have a good day? I had a great day. Thank you so much. Were you working? I did two. No, I did administrative work today and then lots of meetings and things like that, getting caught up. Good. getting. I don't know what getting caught up even means anymore. I don't know that I'll ever be caught up, but I'm glad someone's able to. Well, we have an awesome guest today, friend of both of ours, somebody who I respect greatly, and I'm grateful that she's joined us on the show, Dr. Veronica Lerner. Dr. Lerner, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm super excited to be here, honored, battling imposter syndrome over here after listening to all the amazing podcasts you've recorded. But it's all good. It's all good. And thank you so much for having me here. Would you prefer Dr. Lerner? Would you prefer Veronica? How would... Oh, yes. Thank you so much for bringing this up. You're actually doing simulation pre-briefing. So I love that. That's one of the techniques we always touch base with each other, as well as with our participants about how the podcast is going to go, how we're going to address ourselves. So we're doing your pre-brief. I appreciate that. Yes. First name, last name, Veronica is fine. We're all friends. Doctor is too formal and my preference is not to use it. Perfect. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, I'm the same way in my ORs. We do timeouts. We do our pre-briefing and first names for safety in my ORs. So for our listeners, I know Veronica and I'm, I'm always following what she's doing. She's a minimally invasive GYN surgeon, an associate professor of OBGYN at Zucker School of Medicine, Hofstra Northwell Health. She is the director of simulation for her department at Lenox Hill Hospital. She is an editor, on the, or rather on the editorial board of the Green Journal. She's also the associate editor for the Society for Simulation and Healthcare. And according to her social media, she is a simulationista, which she can explain what that is. I think I have an idea, but that sounds like a big deal. So thank you, Veronica, for being here. And we always like to start our show, our episode with an intro learning about how you got to where you are. You're in Manhattan now, but as an expert in simulation, as a MIG surgeon, how did you end up doing what you're doing, where you're doing it? Great question. The question is always like, how deep do we dig, right? I guess I have to sort of give a little bit of a personal backstory. So I actually was born and raised in Kiev. My family and I lived there until I was 16. And then we immigrated to Denver, Colorado when I was in high school. So I went to high school college and med school in Colorado and came to New York for residency. In residency, I fell in love with surgery, ended up going to Seattle to do my pelvic surgery fellowship, and then came back to New York and started working here some 15 years out of practice. My simulation journey is actually completely random. I tell people you can plan all you want for your future career. You just never know what's going to happen. Opportunities come your way. Have an open mind about it because it just might be something you fall in love with, not even knowing that's what it's going to be like. So that's what happened to me with surgery. And the same thing exactly happened with simulation. So my first job out of fellowship, I was working at Bellevue Hospital. It's a low resource setting, underserved population. And the new chair came around who said, hey, the hospital is building a new simulation center from 9-11 funding. And why don't you have high teaching scores? Why don't you go do sim for a department and figure out what it is? I was like, well, I have no idea what that is. But sure, I'll figure it out. I'll learn it. It's amazing how many times like we get, hey, I need this thing. Will you, will you just go do it? I mean, I, I was third year clerkship director at a fellowship. And I was like, you know, I have no idea how to do that. And they're like, well, you'll learn. And so I love hearing these stories. I mean, go do simulation. Like that's a small task, you know? I mean, okay. So you were asked to just take on simulation at your first job. 
honestly, at that point, it's like sometimes it's better you don't know what you're getting yourself into in some cases. I really had no idea what it actually entailed because my exposure at that point to it was limited to animal like porcine labs that we did in residency, electrosurgery lab on chicken breast when I was an intern and some, you know, CPR code type of stuff that happened at some point in residency. And that was really it. The key point in my career actually was not the simulation center with its budget and all the capital costs. It really was this team that came together with the center. So one of my mentors, uh, Damian Shield, who was the RDAC by training, was getting his master's in simulation. Of note, there are simulation fellowships out there, just we don't know about them, right? Like, But they're actually a really prominent feature out there in the country. They're popular in more traditional settings like ICU, ER care, things like that. You know, actually, we ended up having a first fellowship in OBGYN and simulation, which ran for three years. Now, we have one of your fellow grads who's now the associate director of the Sim Fellowship here at the Cleveland Clinic. You paid it forward, Veronica. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have three fellows that I've graduated and I've stayed in touch with all of them. And they tell me amazing stories of what they're doing with their careers. It's really, really amazing. The future is bright. It's fantastic. Yeah. So Damien basically came to NYU and said, yeah, I'm doing a master's in this. It's a fellowship. I'm getting a master's in education. This is basically what this is. If you're interested, I'll teach you. And it was really the starting point. And what I ended up doing at that point is going to CMS. CMS stands for Center for Medical Simulation. Basically, it's a think tank in Harvard that is the core, you know, kind of the beginning of the simulation, mostly in team training. It consists of clinicians, anesthesiologists, but also organizational psychologists. We talk a lot about breaking down silos. I didn't know what organizational psychology was, but apparently it's a science with a ton of research behind it that tells people how to function well within organizations. Is that what, is that, is that what Adam Grant is? I think he's an organizational psychologist. I don't know if you've read any of his books at all. Yeah, I haven't read his work, but there are several amazing authors out there and, you know, a lot of organizational psychologists out there doing amazing work. So again, it's just like how unaware and how solid we are in our world of medicine, our disciplines. So basically CMS is a cult. I don't know what else to call it, because if you go there, you take a one week long simulation instructor course, it literally changes how your brain thinks. So you're immersed within this amazing training. Your brain is working 100 miles an hour all day long. At the end of the day, you're totally exhausted. You go home, you digest it all, and you just can't wait to go home and implement it in your institution. So it really changed how I think about how I work, what I do day to day. I would say don't try it at home because it doesn't quite work on <laughs> your interpersonal relationships. But anyway, yeah, so basically CMS and then NYU team really got me going. And then the other piece that I had to add later on was the technical skills, because that has the whole other subfield or subspecialty, I guess you can call within the simulation itself. So combining team-based training, communication, and surgical skill was sort of like three core areas that are really focused on and developed. So that's the beginning. That's amazing. So your institution sent you to Boston to take this course. And how many people at your institution did they say? Was it just you and you were tasked with building this thing when you got back? Or Yeah, great point. So dissemination is always the hold up with any like important advocacy intervention, right? Like we're like, how are we going to disseminate this? Like great idea. What's the implementation plan here? You know, I mentioned that CMS is a cult. That's basically what it is. So clearly my chair was visionary enough to say, okay, we're going to send you there for a week. You go do it. We're going to do this right. Now, within NYU, actually, Damien and his team implemented a faculty development program for internal use, so for NYU faculty, and they also put on regional courses. So my course was week-long, but we basically modified it to one- or two-day courses, and then we also did like a half-day course, like a brief intro. And the rest of it ended up mentoring my faculty through different simulations that we've done together. So, for example, somebody who couldn't invest a lot of time but had limited resources, and but they really wanted to do it, I would put them through like a, a primer, basically, and then do simulations with them and debrief them afterwards to give them feedback as we went along. So we basically, you know, few people can kind of dedicate that much time and energy to it, but we can also sprinkle it around and spread it in other ways. Ironically, though, or I guess on a positive note, it's challenging to disseminate, but in my current role in Lennox a year into this job and the 
labor and delivery director here who I'm building obstetrical emergency safety course right now with just randomly ended up being a CMS grad too. Because when he was an MFM fellow, his chair also said, hey, there is a CMS course that they're doing here in New York. Why don't you go take it? Like, again, not knowing what this was, he ended up taking the course. And now we're together randomly at this institution working a program together. We speak the same language. We know exactly how programmatic development is going to roll out. So, you know, it seems like it's so much work how it's going to happen. But I think if there is an impetus for it, culture change will come. So it sounds like when you describe this, it was really like like a top-down vision and opportunity at a certain time because simulation was seen as the next big thing. I know when I was a fellow, Eric Jalosik set up the one here at Cleveland Clinic, and it was billed as a way to really differentiate your, your center. And there was a huge push towards this on the national level even like the consortium with ACOG. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Absolutely. I love this question so much because you brought up like two super important points. Tap down within institutions and nationally, right? Like, how do we think of it this way? I would say simulation revolution probably started about 20 or 30 years ago with some basic things, right? Anesthesia, trying to figure out how to treat a patient who is crashing has unstable airway that they can't intubate. That's how all of this started, right? Like, the scenario of anesthesiologist running around the room trying to intubate a patient, the airway he can't intubate, the LMA is right next to him, but he's not seeing it as an option, right? So those like cognitive processes is kind of how all of this started. This is like a classical scenario development that simulationists often talk about. So it started sort of like that, but then it sort of evolved and it grew sci- from the scientific standpoint so fast that we can pretty much simulate anything at this point. People ask me, can you do the simulation for X, Y, and Z? I was like, of course there is a sim for that. Of course, there is a sim for that, right? So from the practical standpoint, I think the science of simulation evolved so much in the last 30 years that we can pretty much do anything with it. The question is, as you said, how are we going to incorporate it into our our lives? ACOG recognized that there is a significant reduction in obstetric neonatal morbidity and mortality with simulation from the data that's been coming out over the last couple of decades. And they put together a simulation consortium of basically thinkers and leaders in the field on the obstetrical side of things. So this consortium has been working together for the past, I would say, almost 15 years, if not more. So they put in together courses, they write papers, they do research. So it's a very collaborative, amazing group of people with really diverse backgrounds in simulation. So this is like a perfect example of how a national organization came to the front front and put this task force together. On the institution level, it's very interesting because... A trend that I've noticed or that we see is that, let's just say, for example, a big medical center and a medical school will come together, right? And they want to put some, they want to build a reputation. They want to build a name for themselves. So they would put together a simulation center with lots of space, lots of expensive mannequins, huge operating budget, right? Like you need to have those three things. And basically, this, this type of large-scale operation would be financed by both the hospital and the medical school. And of course, you would also mix into nursing schools into that and other allied professionals. So that's the basic formula of how the simulation centers work. Now, if you look at it from the departmental level, it becomes a lot more complicated because you usually have clinicians who are educators trying to do this without all of that enormous support. So how is that going to work? So the departments then go to those centers as clients or consumers, right? So they will be the clients for the center. They'll use the space. They'll use the mannequins. They will take care of faculty development programs, which is what happened to me. And this is how the medical center will integrate clinical departments within their own functionality. However, it still depends upon the initiative of that individual department, right? So that's how the vision of your chair comes into the play. It says, okay, in our education world, we're going to dedicate X, Y, and Z resources to the simulation program. You will interface with the simulation center and build the program. That's how it usually works. Now, what happens if you don't have access to that, right? Let's just say you're not in physical proximity or you're not part of that system. How are you going to figure it out? How are you going to build your program, right? So that's really, in my mind, is a really tough area of just unknown. And that's personally something that's really interesting to me. You know, for example, two years ago, JCO came out with this new mandate 
they basically said we're going to mandate hemorrhage training and preeclampsia training on labor floors. So if you have a labor floor, you have women in labor, you're delivering, you're going to have to do some, right? And that was like a huge splash in the community because the hospitals who don't have access to those resources were like, well, how are we going to do this? How are we going to implement this, right? I really appreciate your question so much. It's like, how are we going to do this outside of simulation centers? And how are we going to allocate those resources, you know, clinically in places where you do have access to it, but your time is limited, right? So that's really the hard conversation to have. I think the mandate is the idea of it is coming from a good place. But it's really an unfunded mandate, essentially, right? Correct. Well, like like most mandates, it's like, we're going to tell you that you have to do it. Good luck figuring out how you're going to pay for it. The sim is specifically extremely labor time and cost intensive. And that's something that, you know, we build a brand new sim center like a lot of institutions do when they do big renovations or new hospital builds. And I've seen this at a few different institutions, not even specifically the one where I currently am, but People love to show off, you know, after a big ribbon cutting, all the expensive equipment, but then it's got to run and it takes people to run. And the, and the initial cost is like just the tip of the iceberg, like any new program. I mean, you know, I, I think whenever you do like, you know, software installs, the, it's tech installs is like, you know, 10% hardware. It's like 90% like maintenance and software because it to keep these things running is incredible. And when you've got physicians and surgeons specifically who are expensive and you're telling us to not be in the OR, not be clinically productive so we can run these simulations, like who's paying for that? And that's where department chairs, hospital leadership have to not just want something or not just say they support it, but you have to put your money where your mouth is. And that's something that I think a lot of us struggle with. We, we have interest in the simulation And I want to talk to you more about like the value, not just like, you know, do people get faster on pegboards, but like the actual clinical value. But I think most of us understand generally the value of of simulation, but how do you implement and actually build a program? And that's what's so impressive. I mean, of the many impressive things that you do, just building these programs that are sustainable and are actually successful in producing people who then go out and teach more simulation. It just, it sounds like a momentous undertaking. So when you're building the program, like what do you tell people? What does it take to build and maintain these kinds of programs? Great question. That's tough to answer because I think it depends on on the circumstances. You know, when we talk about programmatic development, we talk about a systematic way of approaching it, right? It's almost like curriculum development and there are books written about it. But typically you start with needs assessment, figure out what your resources are and define your learning objectives, right? Those are like big things to start with needs assessment, learn objectives, and that everything comes from that. Because as you said, you can have capital budget, you have expensive mannequins sitting in the closet, but without the actual plan of how you're going to do it, it's just going to sit in the closet. Over years, I mean, I would say I've been, been doing this probably for more than like 12 years at this point. And I did start out in the research research environment. At this point, I'm like constantly thinking like, how can I do this in the closet? Because I know you can do it in the closet. And so I'm actually working on like a mobile simulation lab right now. So my current institution, there is a great simulation center, but it's far away from campus where I am right now. Manhattan real estate space, there's basically like none of it here. So I kind of like this past year, just built a simulation lab. All my stuff is stored in boxes in the resident call room underneath the bed and on shelves. And I deploy it for each simulation and I do it in the conference room. You know, it takes time to do it, but you have no space. No, you don't need anything special. Like the first piece of advice I got from one of my mentors is like, you can do simulation in the closet. It's funny you say that. We as residents, when I was in Chicago, they had asked us, you know, we got this grant from this women's group that they were going to, you know, they wanted to buy a simulator. And I, I was like the one person interested in MIGS there. And I got one of the reps to give me like a box trainer and I would just take a, a ovicrol and throw a stitch in the box and tie four knots and cut it and just use an entire suture and then go back to my next case. And that's how I learned to like sew and tie. It was a super lo-fi. And when they asked us what we wanted, they wanted to buy a very expensive VR simulator and you could log in. So they said, no, no, just get us like box trainers, like get us, like make them accessible. But they wanted to have their big, cool looking piece of technology that sat in a closet. And Next to the closet was my box trainer. I, I mean, that's where I, that, that was my sim lab. I found a closet on the post-op floor. 
that I could I could go in there in between cases and teach myself how to sew. But people love having these big showy things. But I've always felt like the lo-fi stuff can be just as effective or maybe even more because it's just so easy to use and it's accessible. You know, we've got a nice big sim center at one hospital, but our GYN service runs at a different hospital. And though Lexington Real Estate is not not Manhattan real estate, for residents to get across the street and park, it's a half an hour to get to where they need to go. To, so I just got them a box trainer and a tower for their GYN workroom. And it's much, much easier to use access like anything else in, in healthcare. Access is like, is like 90% of the battle. So what is your sense on like the high fi versus low fi? Like I've seen a few of your videos. You must have like a Michael's frequent shopper card or something. A lot of duct tape, lots of cardboard, lot, lots of lots of foam. So I think I know the answer, but what's what tell me like high fi versus low fi sim? Like what's your what's your take home? I love that question because I can talk about this for hours. I relate to your story 100% in fellowship. Again, this is before I did anything with Sim. Same thing. I went to the call room and I practiced on a box trainer and, and taught myself how to suture. Exact same story, 100%. And then a couple of years ago, same thing. The program where I was had a you know $150,000 VR simulator set in the closet, dusty. I undusted it, plugged it in, got it to work, and no one used it, right? So it's all about your needs assessment and your curriculum development. You always have to go back to that. My thing about the low tax, the, the, kind of the terminology, you have to be really careful about three terms when it comes to fidelity. One is cost, two is tech, and three is actual fidelity. So let's just say something could be high fidelity and low cost, like your box trainer, because you can actually even use your iPhone with it and make it out of the cardboard box, right? That, that's all you need. You need a cardboard with two holes, third hole for the iPhone, you know, and your instruments from the R. That's it, if you don't have a box trainer. But it is high fidelity because you can sure learn how to do an intercorporeal knot. Ty can teach yourself how to do it pretty easily. So for that one specific test, this device is low cost, high fidelity. Now, if you were to do knot tying on the $150,000 VR trainer, even the robotic one, totally does not work. So I did a session with one of the residents this morning who completed her modules on the robot. And I do the dry lab for them always after they complete their modules before they sit because the VR skills, there's like one limit with the robot, right? Like it's the visual interpretation of the tissue feedback. You don't get that with your hands. So we do basically an extensive suturing and tissue, respect for tissue lab after they finish the modules before they sit on actual models that I make. This is something all of your residents go through. Yeah. So, you know, robot training pathway is mandatory for pretty much all the all three programs where I've been at. So, yeah, I mean, it's a mandate and we can break it down. It's complicated. But yeah, so we're running that for all our residents. So that's an example of high cost, low fidelity, right? So there you have low cost, high fidelity, high cost, low fidelity. And then there's also tech intertwined into that. So your box is low tech, but you can also build, you know, like a, a webcam and you can also build a camera for your box trainer, let's say, or you can have like a high tech, high cost. So a mannequin, high fidelity mannequin with heart rate, you can shock that you can give IV fluids to that talk specs to you would be high tech, high cost. Is it high fidelity? Well, it's arguable because if I'm running a PPH simulation, I would much rather have a standardized patient with a backpack pelvis that bleeds, then a mannequin that lays flat and talks with a microphone. Like what's more realistic? A woman who is hemorrhaging in front of you with all this blood all over the floor who is fainting or a mannequin that's like laying on, on the bed and not moving, right? The fidelity is really a complicated task. And on top of this, remember you have to study fidelity. So you can certainly say, I think it has fidelity. That's just your own take on it. But in order to truly claim that something has fidelity, you actually have to study it. So anyway, that's my long explanation to that question. I was just curious about, you know, what you're saying about fidelity and also just like the visuals and translating that. Are there any studies looking at what happens in terms of the mind-body connection and the muscle memory? Because, okay, I wear progressives, right? They're basically like one to two weeks, you need your brain to adjust the visuals. And then I have a couple friends with hearing loss and they have to listen, to, they do Bluetooth and they train their mind to basically hear through this cochlear implant. And then, you know, when I was a fellow, I remember Mark Walters, our fellowship director, was like, I noticed it takes six months for something to click in your brain for the visual spatial skills 
for all the fellows. And he was like, maybe your curve is going to be different. But he was like, that's what I've observed over time. He was a very keen observer of how people learn. So I was just curious. I'm sure in the sim literature, there's some kind of data on it, learning curve data. Yeah, learning curves are really huge. And that's something I'm really interested in. I mean, I can sort of give like a practical take on it. Then science of learning and brain, how it all digests different inputs. That's like such a complicated topic. Um, I don't know if I can add, like give it justice, but I don't know if you're familiar with the book called Make It Stick. It's like a learning Bible for all of us in terms of simulation and just learning in general. And they really break it down using concrete case studies, examples in the literature of how people learn. So they do incorporate different learning modalities, like mix it up as one of the concepts from that book, for example, that you want to learn in different environments. And that way your brain can kind of transfer the concepts that you're learning better so it sticks better, right? So there is a whole science of cognitive learning behind any learning skill we have. It's like, do we have good understanding of what happens in surgery? I think we're just really starting to scratch the surface. One of the big challenges I've noticed, I noticed it a lot as third-year clerkship director because I think a lot of us like to teach. Being an educator is something I realized is very different and understanding curriculum building and learning styles and all those things. And that's where I said, I think I'm done being clerkship director because it's insanely complicated. And I'm someone who I think learns differently than most of my peers in med school. I think I have found that to be the case throughout my throughout my training and practice. But trying to generalize how to educate people when you go resident to resident to resident and they're like three different species. I mean, they, they learn, think, function so differently. And so you think, oh, wow, I have this great resident who comes in and they're just like operating with you. Like, this is great. They see the planes. This must be because I'm awesome. And then the next one comes in and you're like, where, what have they been doing? And that's, that's a huge challenge that I have is just the variability from learner to learner and how they learn. How does, I guess, is simulation the answer to learning curves? You know, if they're different, they take longer for some than others. Is simulation the way to get everybody to a certain point by the time they get in the OR? Because that's the next thing I think I want to talk about is our limited, true limited learning opportunities in the OR in these clinical situations. Yeah, great question. Like first part of your point, I call it personally and just my understanding of it is like we need individualized learning plans for all learners, right? Like we need to individualize the learning. Does it mean they learn differently from different modalities? Does it mean that we need to match their learning styles? It's actually kind of controversial, you know, but but either way, we have to individualize their learning plans because everybody learns at different pace. They have different backgrounds. They have different skill set. They're just different people. So I think key here is like one does not fit all. And we have to think of individualized learning with different modalities. But the way residency is set up, they said it's four years for everybody. So like it may take somebody three and a half years. It may take someone five years of that. But we don't get to truly individualize every aspect of learning or of teaching rather. And so that that can be really challenging. You know, I've seen that somebody talk from, he's a orthopedic surgery, he was a residency PD or the chair in Canada. And they set up a residency program. It was competence-based learning. It wasn't strictly time-based. And it's super fascinating because also the assessments are also super subjective. That's the other thing that has just come out. I don't know if you saw that, I think it was JAMA Surgery or some sort of big article from University of Washington they looked at the assessments of general surgery residents and they were super based on gender. I mean, and that is- I know we're all, I know we're all shocked. Yeah, but I mean, you know, the less independent learning, lower scores just seems implausible, you know, if you look at this systematically. Yeah, well, don't get misread in assessments because that's going to be another five podcasts later. You know, just a few small things. Like first to tell people, let's separate learning from assessments. Because that's number one thing that makes it harder to conceptualize is that assessment and learning are two different things. So we have to validate our assessments in order to make sense of them. Otherwise, they're useless or biased, as you said. But the science of learning is actually separate from that. So even though there's a lot of overlap, yes, we have to assess our learning, but yet there's also science of assessing, right? So the validity idea behind making sure you have an assessment that's valid for this one thing that valid is not the right word. 
that has enough validity evidence for this one thing you're trying to measure, that's really key. But also whether the, the intervention itself is working, that's the question that we're trying to answer in simulation. So that's a really important thing. But the other thing I wanted to mention is I just think we have to think big. We have to think beyond a four-year residency, right? Like Canadian and European models with the idea of the competency-based assessment is like a really important consideration and got me thinking about like, what are we trying to do here? Like we're trying to learn and we're trying to deliver care, like high quality care, right? So I just have to put like all the barriers aside for a moment. I know it's really hard to do and say, okay, if I could just weigh my magic wand, like what do I see? What is my vision? I will give you like two examples. One, like kind of early on in my simulation career, one of my mentors, Brian Bros, he's actually an MFM who does a lot of um, simulation interventions for ultrasound guided in procedures in MFM. So he actually does that learning curve, learning assessment kind of piece. She basically said, look, I can teach you all you need to know in OBGYN residency using simulation. Remember earlier I said we have a sim for it, doesn't matter what it is. I can graduate a competent resident and teach all I, they need to know in obstetrics using simulation within a year and a half. And I was like, how could this be? But then the more I learned about it, the more I tried it out by myself, the more I realized that actually he's right. So we are like so limited in how we think about education by thinking about four years, by thinking all the other barriers and obstacles we have. Well, so much of it's service. Like so much of what the residents do is like filling out paperwork and getting people's Lovenox or just doing routine stuff that's not actually challenging them and meeting, meeting them at their next learning point, you know, and like pushing them to that next level. It's not the most efficient way. Well, but simulation has to do with procedural skills, not the art of doctoring or human relations. I mean, it's team building. Yes. I, my guess is Veronica has a response, Amy, <laughs> that there's a simulation for everything. Yeah. So it actually has to do with doctoring too. Like, let's just say having a conversation with a patient in clinic and you want to get, you know, take a good history, something really simple, right? There is a sim for that. Like, what can make me better at history taking or, you know, breaking bad news or an emergency, you have an MVI situation going on in your, in your OR or hemorrhage. Like, think of it this way. Everything you do, every single moment at work, there's a sim for that. Every single thing. So whatever it is you want to get better at, you can simulate it. But sorry, just to kind of close the loop on the other conversation, I think we need to just break down the walls, the service, culture change, all those things. Like, we have to think big. Otherwise, we end up, that's why I call myself a simulationista, right? Like we need a revolution. I'm not the one who like come up with this, like Victor Montori actually wrote a patient, you know, patient revolution on it about patient-centric care. But we need a revolution to like change how we think. Because if we think the way we think, we're going to be here and doing the same thing and beating the head against the wall the same way we did before. I'm starting to believe this whole cult thing you were talking about. <laughs> you know, and the last thing I'll say on this, and it also leads to moral injury. So what I mean by that is like, we all have internal drivers to do what we think is the right thing to do, no matter how hard it is, right? And if we don't do it, like it's too hard, we don't have time, we don't have resource, this, that, we end up with burnout. We end up thinking that we didn't do the right thing. We failed, all of that. And so first thing and in, in, in dealing with all this is acknowledge the problem. Yes, simulation is hard. The resources are limited. This is really, really, really challenging. But if we don't do it, we also end up with moral injury, right? So whatever your path is, you know, a lot of your podcasts talk about advocacy work in such a beautiful way. But whatever your path is, you have to stick to it. Because if you don't, I think you will feel like you're just not, you know, getting what you want out of your work life. I agree with that so much. We had this conversation just today with the clinical demands squashing your dreams and just how do you figure out what your needs are? And that is what I wanted to lead into next is how do you articulate the argument for the resources and time for you as the sort of lead, you know, one of the simulation leads, but also for your team? Like, how do you argue for the benefits? What does the institution or the hospital get out of it, you know, instead of you doing 100% clinical, et cetera? Yeah, that's a hard question. I don't think I have a good answer to that. I mean, in some places it comes from above. So I was just lucky that in my first job, the chair said, okay, you go figure out the simulation thing. Here's admin time for that. 
And by the way, there is also four other people who can also have admin time with you. Wow. Yeah. But one of the main reasons for that was the labor floor needed an active obstetrical safety program. And then the clerkship also needed an active OSCE program. So those are like common arms of simulation where it's like, okay, yeah, we need resources. And then again, you start thinking about the hospital's reputation. You start thinking about hemorrhages. Like nobody wants to end up on the front page of New York Post with a postpartum hemorrhage that was preventable, right? So there are those intangible benefits and the reputation that the institution builds for itself. And there's also that need to sort of meet the standard of care and not be behind. So that was like some top bottom approach. The other thing is, I don't know, I'm just kind of carve it out, you know, based on my current contract, which is RVU based right now. And I am just like lucky enough I'm meeting my targets and I have enough protected time that fits into that formula. But is that your time that you have left over that would otherwise be spent doing anything you wanted? Or is that like time that you have a carve out from your RVU targets to do this specifically? If it's not in your contract to do it, then that's not just time that you have for this. It's time away from family, life, whatever else it is outside of work that we all need as well. Yeah. I mean, my contract curtain right now is such that I do have protected admin time, but I also have a total RVU goal, which sort of tramples it in a way, right? So it sort of doesn't really matter how much admin time I have, because if I don't meet my RVU goals, then what am I going to do? It's a little bit of like catch-22. I honestly have not found like a person who said, I'm doing simulation and everything's perfect, right? So you either have admin time that somebody will support you and be in protecting you from clinical work in some shape or form, or it comes from above, or, you know, honestly, I think more effective interventions at this point are like short intervals of like short repetitive sessions. Like for example, this morning, you're yeah, gonna say like, this is crazy, but I did a robot sim this morning from six until seven before the OR started because there is no other way time to do it, right? Am I going to do it every day? No. Can I do it once a month? Probably. Otherwise, like what other sessions would I run? Like I would do, you know, like a six to eight session with the interns because that's when they're available. Of course, my preference is to run a course from nine till three, right? Like, but that doesn't always work. So anyway, I don't have a good answer for you. It's just something that our society, I think, needs to resolve at large and say, okay, simulation is important. Quality is important. This works. We know we need it. But that is an institutional culture. That is something that, you know, when I was in fellowship, they shut down all the ORs from, for, the ha for a half day. So they could have somebody come in and talk about safety and they had a former NASA astronaut and they, and if you weren't in that room, in that auditorium, every chair knew, every head of, you know, every nurse, every tech that was supposed to be, or if you were involved in surgery, you were in that room. And if you could, you know, what it would cost an institution to shut down 30 ORs for a half day, I mean, millions of dollars of lost revenue, but that's telling everybody in that room, this is important. We think this is a big deal. We're stopping everything so we can make sure you understand how important patient safety is. It's not free. It's not free to have these types of situations. And I think that institutions, you know, culture is top down. We've talked about this on, on this show and others. Culture is top down. If the institution doesn't care, if the leadership at an institution doesn't care, it doesn't matter how much you care where you are. And, you know, leaders in culture will say, if you are trying to fight a culture battle from anywhere but the top, be prepared to die on the mountain. And it's one of those things that you can want it, you can do it, but ultimately, if it's not something the people who, who run the place care about, it can be exhausting and, and burnout and those kinds of things happen, I think, as a result of moral injury, I think is the term you brought up, which I think is more accurate, is doing things that you genuinely care about, that you think are important, whether it's patient safety or simulation or all those things, and other people around you don't care. It can be demoralizing. A hundred percent. I was just going to say about team building, about morale, about, and I was just going to say quality safety. Quality safety is just become this whole other pathway. And I know you and I discussed this, Veronica, previously, but like a lot of the simulation folks are kind of getting embedded into the quality and safety. So, you know, there's the OG pathway, the research, the grants, the, you know, papers and speaking. There's education. And now there's this quality and safety pathway in terms of administrative positions that actually come with a lot of time associated with it and resources. And I have to think that there's some, at the Cleveland Clinic, like 
if you get acquired at a, as a hospital, for instance, you get Epic, you get the same kind of like administrative framework that gets rolled out. So Cleveland Clinic, Florida, Cleveland Clinic, Abu Dhabi, they're going to structure it the same way with a, you know, institute model or whatever it is, and vice chair of, of quality and safety. I know what I was before watching a hospital center, Tamika Agusti was doing the simulation work and did stuff in our sim center and a lot of support, like Mark was alluding to with the human factors, PhD researchers, a lot of development of trying to innovate on basically sort of high tech simulation. But they did show some data that was unpublished that it probably decreased liability secondarily by looking at the claims because the claims really went down after they instituted it. So these claims, I mean, in a self-insured system where the healthcare system is just paying out the claim from the bottom line of the hospital can make a big difference if you get a multi-million dollar judgment. So I think in those terms, I mean, like you're saying, OB required it, like labor, labor and suite required it. I think GYN, you know, regarding if certain liability situations, I could see that, but definitely the ED, anesthesia, all these other things. But I think it's super interesting to see how it's sort of rolled out. Can we talk about then? So that's a great point, Amy. Like we talked about the challenges of it, how you got into it, but like the benefits, like what what's the payout? What is the, and I don't just mean financial, I mean, that's certainly going to be part of it, but like simulation, we all think it's good, but like, what's the data? What are the outcomes that we're seeing? Like when you implement a simulation program into a department or an institution, like what should we expect to see? What are the outcomes that we would expect to see, whether it's educational, whether it's patient safety, you know, whether it's the liability stuff that Amy's talking about, what are the benefits of simulation and implementing a simulation program at an institution? Yeah, great question. Amy pretty much nailed it. You know, Marcus, you said the issue of moral injury is dual. One, you burned out from working too hard and not getting support, or it could be from not being able to do the right thing, right? So it's like that duality we're always struggling with. And Amy pretty much nailed it. Quality and safety is this amazing field. I was just having this exact conversation with a friend yesterday that just exploded and created like huge presence for itself, right? And in fact, a lot of simulationists, simulationistas have crossed over in my peer group, have crossed over from simulation into quality for those reasons, right? Now, as Amy said, there is a lot of data in obstetrics where in effective and anesthesia too, uh, in other fields that are similar in that, in that field, that implementing programs decreases your claims. So because obstetrics and OBGYN departments are so heavily dependent on the claim history, like a big lawsuit will make it or break it and put you in the red right away, right? So it was a Green Journal publication from the CMS group in Boston that basically showed the same thing, but it's not just them. So obstetric outcomes, it's well studied, right? It decreases your shoulder dystocia complications, your postpartum hemorrhage, maternal mortality. Like once you implement postpartum hemorrhage program on the floor, your ICU admissions go down, your CHIS go down, and your MTP goes down, right? So it's like, that is really well documented. With gynecology, you know, as I've been discussed on this podcast and written about, there's just not enough financial incentives to get the quality under control for many reasons, right? So like, it's the issue with patient advocacy and gynecological care that was brought up many times. It, again, it's like a, kind of a general question hard to answer, but I think with surgery, we can focus on learning curves, right? What can we do to get our learners or are ready, take advantage of the simulation of operating in a safe environment before they get to the OR? That's number one. So we do have data on learning curves, right? That we have. So we have effective learning strategies. We have models. We can do all of that. So in fact, like for our robot training, it's not just like education, it's also safety, right? So I write from my residents, they're console ready, so they're not robot certified or anything like that. They just have gone through as much training as we could have possibly put them through to take advantage of simulation to make it safe and to help them learn, right? So it's like a dual thing. So I think in surgery, you know, we're looking at metrics that are assessing performance, but also we can use it for, you know, surgeons who want to get better, expand their surgical repertoire, incorporate new procedures, like all of that surgical learning, I think is just part of it. So I don't know if I got derailed from answering your question or if I answered it. I wanted to follow up on this and just say all of these things that you're talking about are just really whirling in my brain because it's also super timely that we're recording this right now because ABOG just approved the EMIGs as the, in terms of, instead of FLS, I think, or as an addition to, I'm not sure, but as a 
the simulation. It's a mandate before you can take your written test. Yes, you have to pass that before you can register for written boards. It's a qualifying exam. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? And I don't know if you were involved in eMIGS, but uh, what is your thought of just incorporating it? I know FLS has been part of the Gen Surge pathway for a long time, but what's the data behind that in the OBGYN? And then do you see a future pathway for MOC or video-based review or something like that in the future? Like, what's the data on that? Yeah, I mean, we totally have to start looking ahead. You know, EMIG, yeah, I'm familiar with it, and, and I wasn't involved in making it, but I know it well. Very similar to FLS in a sense that, like, of how it's delivered, but of course the content and the tasks are joint-specific rather than general surgery based, right? So that's like a big difference. You know, it's complicated. <laughs> so one thought I have in this, and again, it's, it's not a complete answer. It's just a few thoughts that I have. One, first of all, FLS makes a huge difference by sheer fact that it mandated simulation, right? Like we keep coming back to the assumption like mandate, the Janko mandate, the boards mandate, this mandate, that mandate. But again, I think it does change the way you think about it, right? So with FLS, my experience implementing it, like hands-on experience implementing it for the past five years, and now EMIG is coming around into my year five to six, is that if residents do it early on, they show up to the OR, it totally works, right? But they have to do it before they start operating. Because what happens most of the time is the residents learn in the patients, and then they go take the exam right before they graduate in order to register for the written boards, right? That's the formula. And it's not just in GYN, it's in general surgery. So again, ACOG Sim Consortium, just like a great way for me to sort of get plugged into that community, places who mandated FLS early on, even before it became mandatory with their programs, did it early. End of their first year, beginning of the second year, wherever that resident is about to hit their GYN rotation, they had to take it at that point. Then, of course, they show up to the OR, they can find the instruments, they have respect for tissue, they can suture. All of these basic things really struggle with that the skill's already there. This is just like one thought I have had is like, yeah, we have a mandate, of course it works, but it works as it should if we implement it early on and put all this work into teaching residents those skills to take advantage of the exam. So I think we're going to struggle with EMIG in the same sense. So you know, my program director and I, because EMIG is like, registration is like literally just open this week, is we're going to put all our residents through it basically just now. So the first years will take it in their, at the end of their first year before they get on, on their GYN rotation. So now I have another bottleneck rack of people like to do, but don't worry, I'm not doing it at six. It's going to be at decent hours. So basically we will kind of roll it out that way. So I think that's one thing. You asked about the evidence you know, there is there's a publication on sort of the validity work on EMAC that is a really good study. Again, validity is just depends on what context are you looking at it, right? Like a resident's going to do a TLH after taking EMAC? No, but they are going to have basic skills to help them get started early on. And also there's an amazing didactic component, right, that helps to standardize delivery of that information across programs because who has times to put lectures together that are up to date? Like you can just go on and, and watch them online. Like, Thank you, everybody who was involved in making that. But again, like the whole idea of testing, if you talk to Chris Stefano, he's one of our simulation friends, she, he will tell you like, it's not an assessing. It's just, we really need to make small assessments. We need to make like an educational portfolio. So for example, end of your first year, EMIG is your portfolio to pass on to the second year, right? Before you do a TLH, you have to do X, Y, and Z progressive training. Before you sit at the console, you have to go through a robotic training pathway, right? Those little items, little files, or those little assessments and programs are going to be in your educational portfolio. And it's going to cover this whole wide range of different things we're doing. So I think we just have to think of testing in a different way. So that's one thought I have on it. So educational portfolio, I think, is like a way to go, which is similar to competency-based assessment, I think, which you alluded to in Canadian and European models. Crowdsourcing you know, it's not my area of expertise. I do have to say that I tried out CSATs this year to see if I can use it as an educational intervention for the residents. And I'm not quite sure what to make of it. Can you explain what CSATs is for our listeners? Yeah. So I didn't mean to circle them out because it's just like a platform. So basically it's a spinoff. It's a company that allows surgeons to record their videos into cloud. 
And those videos then are reviewed by a group of experts and graded and not necessarily with a grade, but they basically the reviewers will comment on portions of the video or they will interact with you if you ask them a question and comment on, let's just say like, oh, I struggle with this side will dissection here. What do you think? And surgeons will comment on it and also just give you a general assess of what your video looks like. I'm not sure what to make of it. I think Kara King really hit it on her prior podcast with the coaching. You know, I think we need coaching to like get into our heads. I think crowdsourcing is just part of it. Like, is it helpful? Yes. But is it going to get us to think of surgeons or train our surgeons or get better at what we do? I'm just not sure. I think there is that quality piece missing of like, is this an effective intervention? Does it work? You know, what are our learning objectives? Like, what are we going to accomplish with it? And of course, AI plays into it. So I don't know. I don't have a good answer. Crowdsourcing is not my thing. And I, um, I'm i really hoping that in the future it comes around as something that we can use. Well, it sounds like there's, and I actually took care of, took the uh, coaching course in Denver this year. And I agree with you. I think so much of how we have to continue to learn and continue to teach surgical education, because it's not just physical skills. It is not just visual spatial awareness. It is not just decision to the OR. It's all of it. It is the whole thing. It is all the different aspects of what we do wrapped up and rolled into one. And one of the things about coaching that I thought was powerful was that it's a deeper dive into the whys of all of it instead of just like, can you accomplish X, Y, and Z? And so I think that's interesting when you talk about the future of simulation, you know, back to your original point, and to, and to challenge Amy, I mean, there's a simulation for everything. And so really, it's not so much, what, what I'm hearing from you is it's not so much what can we do with simulation, it's what can't we do. That's the sense I'm getting from you. And so correct me if I'm speaking out of turn here, but it sounds like we need to start thinking a little bit more about how we can incorporate all of these things. Because I think me, and for myself, and I, don't, and I imagine others, we think sim, we think pegboards, we think maybe some more high-tech stuff. But the way you talk about simulation from your, your your cult perspective, but just that it, it can literally be everything and how we teach, you know, we just have to maybe think harder about how to simulate each aspect of what we do by better understanding how we learn all these things because it is, it is complex. I mean, you know, becoming a surgeon, becoming anything really, but specifically as, as surgeons, it is hard to simplify what we do and how we learn how to do what we do in a few short words. I mean, there's just so many pieces of it and you think you're good and then go, oh, wait, man, I got this n- next whole thing of development I have to deal with throughout your career. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree 100% with both of you. You know, on one hand, there is the science of learning and the science of simulation that we need to keep advancing, looking at data, looking at evidence. Again, just, you know, the opportunity of being on the simulation healthcare journal and seeing amazing papers on learning in simulation that come through. We're just so lucky people are doing really great scientific research. But the bigger part of it, even for me personally, is implementation, culture change, advocacy. How are we going to deliver this? Like, yes, the science of learning keeps evolving and the science of simulation keeps evolving. But for me, it's like, how do we deliver it to people who need it now? You know, how do we deliver care to patients who need it now? How do we deliver simulation to learners and people in practice who need it now? Those are just sort of like big conversations for us to have as a community, as a society, and they're, they're tough questions. I want to just say one other thing that you're making me think of, and I talked to Chris DeStefano about this, is, and I'm going to challenge you with this idea too, is I think we need some studies on learning curve of teaching, because it's like hard to be a teacher. And I've seen some studies, like Gary Sutkin did something of like breaking down the sling into like 17 steps or whatever it is. But, you know, there's a reason why you can't be a a program director for five years. You have to, like, learn the ropes. You have to, like, know how to practice and you have to learn how to teach. I mean, some people are great teachers out of the out of the box, but I definitely got better with experience. I'm so curious about, like, just teaching people, explaining how to see the plane, explaining how to hold the instruments, explaining what you want them to do. It's changes by generation. My fellows right now to call all the Alice's the sky or whatever. <laughs> it's like just meeting people where they're at and trying to explain it. I mean, I think it's just fascinating. And I don't know, I, Chris was, he knew exactly what I was talking about. I know you know what I'm talking about, but I don't know if there's been any data on that. 
Yeah, for sure. Really, really important. I mean, again, personal stories, right? When I was taking taking my CMS uh, instructor course, like that first initial step, the first thing they do after you get the general idea of how to run a simulation and debrief it is debrief the debrief. It's like if you were the 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 facilitator, debrief watching other instructors learn simulation. Now you have to debrief the person who did the debrief on their job as a debriefer, right? It's really, it's super, it's super meta. <laughs> it's like Inception. I just feel like, I, right, have like me... I have to like listen back to this podcast four times to understand what we're talking about. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Let me it. take this a step further, right? So you have to debrief the debriefer. Now, there's also another scenario where the debriefer would debrief the debriefer who debriefed the debriefer, right? That's the dissemination of simulation issue. Like you have to teach the teacher to train the trainer to train the trainer, right? So like that whole thing of constantly learning how to teach, they actually have a dash and simulation. There's a dash tool that exactly does that. So you're asking about the data. Yes, people study that and they have tools of how to do that. So yes. So the answer to that is, of course, there is a science of teaching behind it and simulation included. And yeah, with Kara King's course, when I took her course a year ago, first thing I said, okay, I'm going to record myself doing this coaching session. I need you to coach me on my session. And so we sit down, we watch the video that I've recorded myself coaching my fellow, all confidential, of course. And then she coached me as a coach on how to be a coach, right? So the idea of teaching the teacher, training the trainer, and then disseminating that is like incredibly important. And yes, there is data on that, but there is also, you know, we need more information always. Wow. You guys get to get it deep. We get into your head. That's a cult. Welcome. <laughs> exactly. Now, I, I thought maybe we could break this down and simplify it for our listeners, but I think everybody's brain just cracked a little bit listening to this. I mean, yes, join our cult. It's fun. Yeah, it is clearly important. It's also clearly incredibly difficult and incredibly complex. And so I'm grateful that people like you who are talented and brilliant can help bring this, bring these ideas to our listeners and to us. I know Amy and I are super excited to have you here today. Uh, I know you're very busy with your 6 a.m. teaching sessions. Just one. <laughs> I will not be forgiven for that, will I? <laughs> no, 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 no. Every time I see you, we'll bring it up. But no, thank you, Veronica, so much for being on. I don't know how we can possibly squeeze any more simulation information into my brain before it explodes. So I think I need to digest and listen back to this before I can talk to you again about it, because it was honestly fascinating. And I think I think it is exciting to see where this goes. And I'm thrilled that one of the leaders of the future of simulation came on our show to chat with us about it. So thank you, Veronica. Thank you. It's very kind. I love this conversation so much. And I cannot thank you enough for what you've done for our community with Backtable. Like I said, I've listened to every single one of your episodes, the amount of advocacy community agency is just amazing. I'm so appreciative of the show as a listener. And also I very much appreciate an opportunity to talk about what I love. Thank you so much. And it's been, like you said, you never know, you know, you can plan for things, but I'm sure Amy knew exactly what I was calling her about when I was asking her to join me on this podcast. We, It's one of those things that just like all of a sudden we go, I guess we're doing, doing a podcast, but it's been an absolute joy to get to talk to friends and highlight the great things that they're doing and teaching us and teaching our listeners. And so very lucky to get to do this. Very lucky to get to have Amy to get to do this with and, and our other hosts. And, and so lucky to have our friends come join us to tell us about all the great things they're doing and especially you, Veronica. So thank you again for joining us. And I look forward to talking to you again after I listen back to this episode to understand. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the future episodes. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to follow the podcast, rate it five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable OBGYN on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable OBGYN is hosted by myself, Mark Hoffman. And Amy Park. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhirter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's version Hess and Yvonne Ogrodzinski. Show notes and social media by Jody Lenora. Administrative support provided by Jim Lee Kinnebrew. Music written and performed by Scott Baby Daddy Hoffman. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next time.
The views and opinions expressed by the hosts and guests on Backtable OBGYN are their own and do not reflect the views or positions of their employers or any entities they represent.